If everybody could take a seat so we can get started. We got a lot to cover in a little bit of time. Oh, there's Bernita. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we need to get started now. If you can have a seat. All right. I'm really excited that everybody could be here today to do this session on communicating with data to advance racial equity. It's something we've been planning for almost a year now um, because it was content we really wanted to talk about um, and an issue that we feel is really important both locally for all of you partners and nationally um, to do this work together as a network. Um, so like many of you, in my own work, in my own research, um, it's been focused on low-income communities, which are too often communities of color. In the last several years, I've analyzed racial inequities in the greater DC area and broadened my understanding of equity and structural racism. Um, and at the same time, the Urban Institute, where we're at, began evaluating its own practice, including looking at about how we communicate race in our own research. They began asking questions about whether our research actually helps advance equity. And considering whether the way a researcher frames those questions or their findings may actually cause further harm to communities of color. And this idea that I might, even if inadvertently, cause harm to people and communities that I was actually trying to help really horrified me. So I can imagine that at least some of you can relate to my experience that I was focused on my motivation for doing the work and less focused on how people were receiving the work. And I know that many partners still think of themselves as neutral data intermediaries, but we need, to, um, and I think that can still be true, but we really have to think that people are not neutral receivers of information, and we have to take that into account as we do our work. So today we brought in a national expert, Julie Nelson, to share what she and her organizations have learned about how the communications can be used to advance equity. Um, and we hope that this session can provide really a starting point for the network to begin work on this issue. And we wanna think about how advancing our practices to use data in ways that influence people to consider more equitable policies and solutions for their communities. So I know we only have two hours today, which may sound like a lot, but we're gonna try to pack a lot into it. Um, and it's not nearly enough time to really cover this in the depth that we need to but hopefully this can be a starting point to spur all of you to think about your own practices. You have Julie's bio in the packet. Um, she is a senior vice president for the New Race Forward, which is a union of two of the leading nonprofit racial justice organizations in the country, Race Forward and the Center for Social Inclusion. And she is also the director of the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. And we'll have um, two of our partners, Bernita from Neighborhood Nexus, who's gonna share about 
some her reflections on this her Atlanta experience, and then Rebecca Hefner from the city of Charlotte has bravely volunteered the Charlotte Quality of Life Explorer as an example for an activity later on in the session. So as you see in your packet, the session is divided into three parts, and we'll break up each segment with a little bit of interaction and an activity. Um, but since we got a lot to cover, I'm going to turn it over to Julie to get us started. Good afternoon. Okay, let's make that interactive. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. It is really hard to talk to people after lunch. Um, and so I am hoping that we're going to, we are going to keep it interactive uh, so that you're not uh, just sitting here listening. Uh, recognize that there's a huge amount of expertise in the room. Um, so I'm also interested in learning from you. A uh, couple things to tell you about myself, just um, in addition to my bio. I spent the bulk of my career working in local government. And some of you work in local government. Raise your hand. OK. And if you have ever worked for local government, raise your hand. And if you use local government, would you raise your hand? <laughs> OK. So my, the bulk of my career was in government, have a, a deep passion for the public sector, thinking about the role of the public sector in uh, the public good. And we know that racial inequities are not for the public good. Uh, so after working 23 years in the city of Seattle, the last 10 of which I was the director of the Office for Civil Rights, uh, really wanted to take the work that we were we're doing in Seattle on institutional and structural racism to a national scope and scale. Uh, started the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And I'm going to share a little bit about the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, but first to say we are a part of, uh, I have a clicker, but how close do I have to be? I don't like podiums. No, I think So look over the shoulder means that you'll advance it for me? Sure. OK, thank you. Uh, I thought it was working earlier. So uh, part, next slide, please. Uh, with uh, the organization Race Forward, Leah mentioned it. Um, Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a national network. I'm just going to use the podium. It's fine. <laughs> OK, uh, so Government Alliance on Race and Equity is a national network of people in government, a membership-led, membership-driven network of people working within government to actually transform government into that public sector for the public good. Uh, we have a field of practice, we provide tools um, put, to put theory into action. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, but the uh, setup for today, we want to start with a little bit of a framework for how we can think about racial equity. Uh, sometimes people think about racial equity from the perspective of, like, there's bad people doing bad things. And there are bad people doing bad things, but that's not the only way that we think about racial equity. Uh, the reality is, is that when you look across the country, your race predicts how well you'll do. Regardless of what region, regardless of whether you live in an urban, rural, or suburban environment, um, race is a factor in people's lives. And so for us, thinking about it from a values perspective, it's not a question of values. And in fact, thinking about values, both from a historical perspective and from a perspective of how we're socialized, we've had ideas of equality and justice around for quite a while. So you can take the statement, all men are created equal. Uh, who remembers who wrote that? Who? Thomas Jefferson. And uh, when Thomas Jefferson wrote, all men are created equal, who was he including in that? White men who owned property, right? So very, very, although it was revolutionary at the time, if I came in here today and said, I'm going to talk to you about equality for white men who own property, like, I wouldn't be a welcome speaker, right? Um, and yet, like, these ideas of around equality um, have been fundamental, and they have evolved. 
we're also deeply socialized when it comes to ideas of equality and justice. So daily basis, millions and millions of school children reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, saying the words with liberty and justice for all. And I know for me, even as a kid, like saying those words was a little bit confusing. Like I could look around my, my world and see that there was not a whole lot of liberty and justice for everyone. And yet we purport that to, to be our values, right? Then this last thing, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, last history uh, question, I promise. Uh, where does that come from? I love it when people whisper. <laughs> <laughs> I heard like this really low, I think someone said Gettysburg Address. Um, and they were right, so you should have shouted it out. Um, Gettysburg Address. And so this idea of thinking about the role of government and who government serves, who benefits from government, do we really have a government that is about the people? So we also have to be super clear that racial inequities are not just random. They're not natural. We have racial inequities because they were intentionally created over the vast majority of our country's history. There have been laws, policies, practices um, prescribing who could be a citizen, who could vote, who could own property, who was property, who could live where. All of those were laws that created racial inequities and it was the vast majority of our country's history done on an explicit basis. Uh, did it suddenly happen, just randomly happen, that one day government woke up and said, my bad, we're going to do something different? No, of course not. Why did change happen? Change happened because we had community organizing, marching in the street, demanding things like a Civil Rights Act, demanding a Fair Housing Act. Uh, demanding change, basically. And so we need to be able to recognize those important milestones that have taken place, celebrate them, but we also have to recognize that they're not enough, that some of the racial inequities that we see in communities continuing, in fact, are worse now than they were at the time of the civil rights movement. So what we've done so far, not enough. Uh, that's where we come in, thinking about the ways that policies, practices, and procedures can continue to perpetuate inequities even if they don't explicitly say so. So that's the opportunity we have, and it's um, actually a really wonderful opportunity to bring greater alliance between what our values are and what our actions are, especially our actions within institutions. So when I mentioned that we have a field of practice, there's three main things that we have found critical to this idea of working on racial equity. Number one, normalizing conversations about race. That if, in fact, it's a tense conversation, uh, people's palms sweat, they get nervous, uh, that's not an effective space for people to have conversations. So we have to be able to normalize conversations about race. Uh, we also have to be able to operationalize. And by that, what I mean is that we have to change institutional policy and practice, organizational policy and practice. And it's really important to think about because there's a lot of organizations, um, public sector, private sector, nonprofits, where there's a whole lot of training that takes place. People get sent to, to training. Some of the training's good, some of it not good. But the question at the end of the day is after you go to training, do you do anything with the information? And so that's where we really push, is that we have to be able to operationalize new policies and practices. There's specific uh, methodology that we um, like to use. Using a racial equity tool is one such thing. Uh, and you'll notice that data is also listed under operationalizing. And I didn't just put it up there for you all. Um, <laughs> We love data, and we also recognize that data um, doesn't change people's, people's thinking. That if people are presented with data that is counter to what their beliefs are, they just discount the data. Uh, so for any of you who think that like story is not important, it is incredibly important for us to be intentional in thinking about what the stories are that we're telling when it comes to data. The last thing, Organizing, talked about community organizing, that can, needs to continue to happen. 
but we also have to recognize that there's organizing that takes place within institutions. And so right now, within your organizations, do you have racial equity work groups? Do you have racial equity action plans? That inside, outside organizing has been demonstrated to bring about change more quickly. We can get more traction more readily. So that's how we think about organizing. Uniting all of these three things, normalizing, operationalizing, organizing, we have to have a vision, a vision of what's actually possible. So within that idea of normalizing, there are some key concepts that I am going to walk through really, really quickly. And we want to get to, I know the um, goal today is to talk about data and communications, but it's important that we understand some of these key concepts before we do that. So some of the terminology that gets used sometimes, people use equity and equality interchangeably. And for us, they are not interchangeable. And I'll give you an example what I mean by that. Uh, you all, I can tell just by looking at you, you have all been to some sort of public um, big event over the past year, uh, be it a football game or symphony or a rock show, some sort of big event. Halftime comes, intermission comes, and everyone files out and goes to the bathroom. What is the difference in experience for men versus women? <laughs> women in the room? <laughs> lines. Okay. And how much longer are the lines? <laughs> A lot longer, hours. They're significantly different, right? But from a design perspective, we've got equal facilities, but the experience is dramatically different. Now, this is an interesting example because the response to this next question has shifted over the past couple of years. Because I used to ask, you know, so what's a strategy for changing that? And the first response people would always give is more bathrooms for women. And it's still a reasonable response, but the whole conversation around transgender communities has led to a different conversation. And so for us to think about populations, whether it's people who are transgendered or whether we're talking about parents with children, people with elders, when you have to go to the restroom, it, like what are the facilities that are going to best serve you? And so when we put the population that is the system's not working for at the center of that discussion, then oftentimes we come up with solutions that work better for everyone. So equality is sameness, equity is focusing on the outcomes. Are we achieving the outcomes that we want? Now we lead with the issue of race. And by that, what I mean is that there's lots of areas of marginalization. Uh, turns out that sexism, heterosexism, ageism, ableism, there's a lot of areas of marginalization that exist, and it's important that we address all of them. What we have found is, is that leading with race is it's a strategic decision for us. And the reasons why, number one, we know that those racial inequities are deep and pervasive, and the numbers aren't shifting. Number two, racial anxiety. I love it when sociologists come up with um, new words like racial anxiety. All it means is that people get stressed out talking about race. Um, it's actually gotten more stressful as de demographics have shifted. And that's true not just for white communities, it's true for all communities. So racial anxiety is on, on the rise. Third thing is, is that we focus on an institutional and structural approach, looking at racism. We can do the same thing looking at sexism or any of the other areas of marginalization. So it's a muscle to, uh, to, to strengthen, a skill to build, that once we've got that skill looking at an institutional approach, it can be used in multiple ways. The last thing in my mind is perhaps most important, and that is about specificity. Sometimes when I get invited into a room to talk about um, equity, uh, they'll say, just talk about equity, don't talk about race, and, which is a sign <laughs> in and of itself. Um, and the problem is, is that the strategies that we need to develop as interventions to address racism are not the same strategies as sexism or ableism. We have to be able to have the skills to do the analysis to come up with the right strategies. Just clumping everything all together means that we don't have the ability to do that. 
So we lead with the issue of race, but it's a both and approach, uh, using an intersectional approach so that we can talk about ways in which women of color are disproportionately impacted or looking at issues around sexual orientation. Using an intersectional approach is, is really a pivotal thing for us. So I've said we've got racial inequities across the country, across every single indicator for success, from uh, birth to death, from uh, life expectancy. Um, some places, uh, difference in life expectancy of up to 30 years. That was one of the key findings that came out of the Ferguson Commission report where that report was intentionally looking at criminal justice, but the reality is, is that a 30-year difference in life expectancy, that's not just about the criminal justice system. That's about the failure of every single system. Uh, the reality that we've got racial inequities, like to name the fact that, that addressing those is one part of the strategy, but we also need to be able to have a definition of racial equity. And the definition that we use is that we need to close those gaps and we need to do it in such a way that we lift up outcomes for everyone. Because in fact, you could close the gap just by making things equally bad for everyone. It, the gaps would be closed, but that's not what we're talking about, that we need to lift up outcomes for everyone. The thing to think about here is that oftentimes when we're talking about racial inequities, we want to jump to sort of programs or services. Uh, and what happens with that is what we end up doing is treating people of color, communities of color, as if they are a problem to be fixed as opposed to the institutions and systems. And so while we know that uh, programs are really important, critical life or death in many situations, they're not going to be enough to actually change the outcomes. So racial inequity, racial equity, key definitions. Uh, the next uh, two definitions, um, explicit bias, implicit bias. Um, implicit bias has been all sort of the buzz. Uh, Starbucks is closing half a day to have all of their stores go through implicit bias training. Um, I shouldn't, like, I'm kind of rolling my eyes when I say that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> the, the truth is, is that uh, I do have some concerns around implicit bias training because we have to be able to have the rigor to know what actually works. The danger with implicit bias is that it plays out at the unconscious level. People are not choosing to be biased. And so um, uh, trying to train someone on something that's playing out that they're not actively choosing, the data around the training is really marginal. Where it has been shown to be effective is when it's piggybacked with institutional interventions, which I'll get to in just a second. So explicit bias, I sometimes think about from a perspective of old school racism. It was direct, it was conscious, there was no question about it. Uh, if you saw a sign in the window of an apartment that was for rent that said whites only, that was explicit bias. That was explicit racism, right? Implicit bias, on the other hand, is playing out at the unconscious level. If you ask people, are you treating people differently, the most common response is, no, I would never do that. I don't see color. I treat people fairly. And then sometimes you look at data, and based on behaviors, you can see that there are differences in patterns. So when I was the director of the Office for Civil Rights, uh, we did fair housing testing, did it on multiple protected classes, but when we did it on race, sent a white person and a person of color, an African-American person, out to look for housing, same apartment complex, same day, and then compare differences in experience. So in Seattle, anyone from Seattle here? Yay, Seattle. Um, so Seattle um, is this place that has sort of a progressive reputation, um, and there's lots of things that Seattle can point to that, um, yeah, they, there are progressive things that happen there, but the reality is Seattle's got the same racial inequities as the rest of the country. And in fact, when it came to fair housing testing, 69% differential treatment. 69, but that's more than two thirds of the time differential treatment. Not a single time was there a sign in the window that said whites only. However, um, it doesn't mean that there wasn't similar impact. And so uh, there were differences in the rent that was charged, hundreds of dollars of difference. Uh, there were differences in white person coming, knocks on the door, 
the, and gets told, oh yeah, we've got five units available, the African American person comes and gets told, uh, I think we just rented the only unit we had available. Now both of those two examples are illegal. That's illegal housing discrimination. So as the director of the Office for Civil Rights, I went after those landlords, filed charges, went after them. But it left a whole group in the middle where it did not meet the standard of the law as far as housing discrimination is concerned. So I went to sit down with those landlords to have a conversation with them, present, uh, present some data to them. What do you think their response was? Anyone? Oh, come on, interaction here, help me. <laughs> I don't do that, yeah. A fair amount of defensiveness, um, and you know, it really felt like people were pretty sincere in what they were saying. Um, and so then the question becomes, if this is truly like at the unconscious level, what's the intervention? Because what we want is fair housing. So what we came up with was um, two things. Did implicit bias training, which as I said, by itself is not um, gonna necessarily change mu much, but what we also did was come up with a uniform set of policies. So that when someone came to look for housing, you did A, B, C, D, E, the same for every single person. So that's an institutional intervention. Uh, this is taking those sort of breaking them into columns, the differences between implicit, explicit, individual, and institutional. Uh, the example that I really want to focus on here, I'm not going to talk about all four of them. What I want to focus on is institutional and implicit. This is based on some work that we've done with police departments. So all of these examples are from police officers directly. The institutional and implicit bias um, example they came up with had to do with drug use and drug dealing. So uh, who uses drugs more, white people or people of color? White people. Um, slight differences depending on the specific drug, but overall drug use, uh, white people use drugs more. Who deals drugs more, white people or people of color? White people. That looks like, yeah, I love the like monotone tone there, <laughs> white people. <laughs> um, uh, so the, what officers were strategizing about is that there's differences in patterns in the way that different populations actually deal drugs. So how do white people more typically deal drugs? <laughs> that is so wonderful because sometimes like I get like this stare like you know white people acting like they don't know you know <laughs> yeah so um, a general pattern much more likely to be in social settings so college dorms parties um, not street level drug dealing um, general pattern street level drug dealing more likely to be african-american or latino um, and again, there's always exceptions to patterns, but what officers observed is that if we're putting our resources towards street level drug dealing, then what we're doing from the very get go is creating some racial inequities. We know that every single step of the criminal justice system, there is disproportionality from who gets stopped, who gets charged, who gets prosecuted, who gets convicted and who goes to jail and for how long more and more disproportionality. So what cops said is that let's look at the very, very beginning how we're actually uh, affecting drug dealing. Um, and the thing that's tricky is that then there's some of them who were not happy because they thought we were saying, you know, de-police. And that is not the, the point here. The point here in using a racial equity analysis is actually to say, yeah, is what you're doing right? Are there additional things that you should be doing? Are our laws the right laws in the first place? Ask, asking those sorts of questions can actually help lead you to different outcomes. So the last set of definitions um, that I wanna leave you with before the first activity is around racism. And so if race can be a loaded word, racism is an even more loaded word. And so I'd like to be super clear around what the differences are between different types of racism. So individual racism, uh, bigotry or discrimination by an individual person. 
Institutional racism is policies, practices, or procedures that work better for white people than for people of color, oftentimes inadvertently or unintentionally. Historically, it may have been explicit, but for the most part, it's not, it's not explicit right now. And then structural racism just means that we have institutional racism across every single institution, plus we've got historical legacies and we've got ways that we're socialized around race. And it's at the structural level where inequities are created and maintained within communities. So that was like a super, super quick set of definitions. Uh, and what we want to do now is to give you a little bit of time at your table to have a conversation around what examples of implicit bias or institutional or structural racism have you seen play out in your communities. So, oh, and we were going to do not the full table, split your table in half so groups of like three or four people have a conversation so everyone has a chance to talk. Hello. Uh, 
All right, we want to bring it back together. Um, just to get a little bit more activity, why doesn't everybody stand up? Take a quick stretch before we dive into communicating. And I'm actually going to ask the folks sitting in chairs back there, if you wouldn't mind picking up your chair, if you are able to, and come around to the table at the front so that you guys can participate in some of the table talks that we'll be having later in the session. We've got a couple seats already open. Do you guys have an open seat? Anyone over there? Yes, there's an open seat. If there are open seats at other tables, please raise your hand. Thank you for playing along. <laughs> There's two up here. Come on, Saran, I see you back there. Oh, he has to go? <laughs> okay. If you can hear me, raise your hand. Thank you so much. I uh, want to ask a question. Was, it, was that a pretty easy exercise? or uh, You depersonalized it. Good. Um, because actually, um, it is uh, the, the next question I was going to ask, how many of you, raise your hand, have ever had a conversation about race that went poorly? <laughs> OK. What are some of the reasons why conversations about race go poorly? Fear, fear, nervousness, sensitivity, not wanting to offend. What was that in the back? Justification, gentrification, justification for gentrification, ignorance, not wanting to take action. OK, so 30 seconds there. You all named a lot of reasons why sometimes conversations about race go poorly. And when something goes poorly, they're, t they're just this human behavior thing that sometimes you don't want to do it, right? Um, if it uh, have a pattern of going poorly, like avoid it. The problem with that is, is that if we avoid it, then we just keep replicating the same outcomes. And so uh, we find it incredibly important for people to build the skills, to build the muscle, to be able to have conversations about race. Now, at, uh, you, we can think about this both on an interpersonal level and a policy level, right? Um, so you all have data that you tell stories, sometimes with disaggregated data. Right? So the question becomes, what stories are we telling about that data? Challenge can be is that when we've got things playing in the background at the unconscious level, uh, we need to think about how we're representing the reason why we have disparate outcomes. It's tricky because when we're talking about race, we have implicit bias playing out. But it's not the only thing we have playing out. Um, the other thing that we have playing out is um, symbolic racism. Uh, now, the word symbolic racism, sometimes like the coding that goes on around um, uh, talking about race but not naming race, you know, um, like uh, going a few years back during uh, Reagan's campaign, uh, welfare queens, right? Was that about race? Did he name race? No. What are other ways that we talk about race but use coded language? Urban, Urban immigration, <laughs> marginalized communities, inner city. I have a friend whose nephew works um, in the film industry, and he's a person of color, but the director is always saying, give me urban, give me urban. Uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, Revitalization. Now, see, what's great about this conversation is that sometimes we can talk about coded language from the perspective of people who are perpetuating, you know, like trying to maintain racism. But the reality is, is that those of us who would say that we're trying to counter or advance racial equity also use our own coded language. And so in grant proposals, if you're talking about like at-risk youth or marginali marginalized communities, all that coded language, actually what it does is that it means that we're not having the explicit conversation both about history and the underlying drivers of what has created racial inequities. So you put these two things together, implicit bias 
and symbolic racism, you trigger race, and what plays in people's minds, like if there's a headline around disproportionality in uh, high school dropouts or something like that. When there's implicit bias, and we know that there's coded language that uh, is playing out, what walks away, what plays in people's minds is the fact that kids of color are not smart, their families don't care. It's all about the individual failures as opposed to looking at the institutional and structural drivers that are creating and maintaining inequities. So to be able to counter that, we need to be able to do so directly. Uh, I want to give you an example here. This um, actually, oh, whoops. Um, this is uh, thinking about what dominant narratives are. This is like, there's nothing special about this article. I honestly was just like trying to find something to use as an example. And so Googled, uh, 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 searched for educational um, issues. And so this headline, African American students would get extra funding under proposal before legislature. Now this, I'm guessing, is something that many of you would probably support, that when we've got underfunded schools, when we know that schools um, are particularly poor in low-income communities of color, like, yeah, we want funding for schools, but let's think about like what the messages are that are conveyed. First of all, from a dominant narrative perspective, there's often this idea of like sort of who the makers are and who the takers are, right? Even this headline around African Americans getting something as if like they're undeserving or as if like the system currently is funding what they should have, they get something. And then this first paragraph over here, California districts with African American students, currently the lowest performing ethnic or racial student group would re receive additional funding. So this identification from the very, very get-go that the students are failing without any sort of recognition around what the drivers are there. And then it goes into data, lots and lots of data, hold income constant and look at disproportionality, but there is no story that is told around what, what the data is. And so for us to think how we're using data, not just as, you know, like plopping data down, but actually using data to tell a story that's gonna help advance racial equity. Uh, we need to move beyond thinking about failures of individuals to look at the historical drivers and to look at systems and structures. Not as people of color as takers, but people of color as contributing assets for our communities. Uh, lack of historical acknowledgement or understanding. And then the last uh, dominant narrative that is also associated with race is the idea around government. Who government serves? government inefficiency, government bureaucracy. Attacks on government, we can definitely look at from a racialized perspective. So this is what we're trying to counter, using data to counter these dominant narratives. Uh, at the Center for Social Inclusion, we had um, long thought that we wanted to do a better job talking about race from a policy perspective. Uh, we knew in our gut that what most organizations were doing was not effective. Uh, much as we love to trust our gut, our gut isn't always the best thing to use as like making the case. So we did multiple rounds of testing of different types of messages to see what messages sell, what messages get supported. So we looked at uh, issues around housing, taxes, public um, policy on uh, health care, those three things. Some messages were race neutral, quote unquote, did not mention race at all. Some implicitly mentioned race, so language like marginalized communities. And then the third was an explicitly, was explicit about race. And um, lo and behold, the explicit message about race was the one that garnered the most support for the progressive policies. Um, the reasoning behind it, looking at some of the follow-up work that we did, that when race is put on the table explicit, it allows the brain to sort of move back into alignment, values, and thinking. Um, the unconscious level and the conscious level. That if we're doing it, the implicit language, then what we tr do is trigger, trigger implicit bias in a way that is not actually helpful. So based on this testing, we came up with a, 
uh, methodology for talking about race. It's a really, really simple methodology, um, and it's not complicated. First thing is you have to start with an affirmation. Um, have to recognize people's um, shared values and their humanity. Second thing is the counter. Explain why there is a problem from an institutional systemic perspective. Take on race directly in the middle and then offer the transformation, offer the step that comes afterwards. Um, so like with the Affirm Counter Transform, if we're talking about public education, using that as an example, an Affirm message might be something along the lines of, all of our children deserve high quality public education. Then moving to the counter, you might make the pitch along the lines of, right now, 60% of African American and Latino students don't finish high school on time. We can look at issues around subjective disciplinary practices. We can look at disproportionality within the uh, teacher base. There are institutional drivers that are creating that racial inequity. What we need to do, and this is moving into the transform, is to change policies around the disciplinary process. Need to change the hiring practices so we get a teacher base that reflects the student base. Those are the solutions that are gonna help all of our children succeed. So that affirm, counter, transform, the most important thing is the data is in the middle. You start with shared values and then the data with an institutional explanation and then move to the transform. So any quick questions on this as a model? Um, was about people who didn't want to, or some of our organizations don't want to present the solution, or do they don't want to be the policy, they don't want to be the ones that are doing the policy um, prescriptive um, if they want to be the uh, impartial provider of the information. So they could do a firm encounter, but um, transform might be harder for some, some of them on the what to do about it. Yeah, and I wonder, like, I, I hear that, and, like, uh, providing data, um, I would just ask sort of what's the point of providing data if you're actually not going to use it? Um, that there is no such thing as neutral data. That um, data gets interpreted, stories are told about data. It's not like you just put data up by itself. There's words that go along with it. And so from a policy perspective, even if you don't do policy, um, are there opportunities like to partner with other organizations? Or how do you make your data available to other organizations who are doing the, the policy part of it? Lots of options there. Okay, I w there's a, I'm gonna skip that because I want, I don't wanna cut um, Bernita's time short. Um, we're really fortunate to have Bernita Smith um, come up to share some of her reflections based on the work that she's been doing in Atlanta. And I feel like I talked so fast, so I'm sorry for that. Well, one of the things that we've been working on is we've been building websites for our different groups, our partners that we've been working with in order to share our data visualization tools. And so instead of us just giving them the data in PDF or something like that, that way many people could use it. So we were working on with Annie Casey Foundation and they're changing the odds and we realized that they wanted their data disaggregated by race and it was like oh okay and then we started analyzing the data and our next project was working with spark which is transformation alliance and i had to go back and request it and was like okay that was good but now can you disaggregate it all by race and it was spurred on because of the change in the odds and then that way instead of us just given the basic of being data neutral we were allowing people then to be able to look at it by race and just saying white, black, or Asian. And then we started seeing patterns in some of our neighborhoods. And it was like, oh, look at this change of like Asians that moved in. And we've never talked about that in some of our areas. Instead of just saying gentrification has just been black and white, there has been an influx of Asians. And in Atlanta, there aren't that many Asians inside the city. Outside the city there are, but now we've found patterns throughout. So now we're at the point of how do we actually analyze it so we're not saying 
always communities as just people of color, low income, but kind of highlighting that part. And now I want to use disaggregating data by race as a tool that we continually use now. So, and that's why I think this is important for us to learn of how to construct things on a racial in a racial equity way. And I think as a group, as a network, we should start doing that instead of just being data neutral or race neutral in the, our work. That's it. Oh, from our reaction from our groups has been great because they can actually, you know, the Tableau uh, dashboards that Eric's building, been building for all our groups, now they can actually just pull down and they're starting to see where the trend is. And if we're having an influx or a, Asians in our community, then we actually need to reach out to that community instead of only focusing on two races because there are people that are deciding to move into those communities. So I think it's going to help us, you know, I think it gives us a whole new insight to our data, but we just need to know how to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you. So I want you to have another table talk conversation about data. And the questions here are, where have or could you use data to advance racial equity? Where have or could you tackle a dominant narrative? And what are the strategies that have been successful? Physical products, presentations, briefing, interactions. So share what it is that has been working or that you've been challenged by within your own communities. And how much time are we going to give them for this? About 10 minutes for this. <laughs> 
One minute warning, one minute. Um, for the, yeah. here, yeah. And so, should we do the, this yeah, debrief yeah. and then I'll come back and yeah, then turn yeah. it over to Rebecca? Yeah. If you can hear me, raise your hand. And also iterative. If you can hear me, raise Those your hand. Sometimes, not sometimes I do, if you can hear me, clap your hands. But uh, some people find that a little bit obnoxious. Um, so would love to uh, get some of your conversation into the big group. And so um, gonna, we have some roving microphones and uh, would just ask for some volunteers to share some of the conversation you had. Oh, you go all shy now. Um, so we ended up with quite a discussion specifically around the Asian population and I have to admit to this crowd that I kicked it off by confessing to being a racist. Um, because of the way that I have dealt with how we present the Asian population in our data. And um, although we were cross-cutting by ethnicity, when we are doing mapping and geographic representation, the Asian population as a whole is pretty small, and so they, we were suppressing that in our representation, and I had the Asian community who thankfully a number of those folks knew me, and they challenged me and said, why are we invisible in Austin? And I had to explain why. Um, and at any rate, that kicked off quite a discussion at our table about what is Asian, all the different varieties of Asian ethnicities, and then the economic stratification across different Asian ethnicities, and as well as the geographic. So that was a... a a deeper dive on that particular area, I think one of the strategies that we got to was being able to take the data um, and cross-tab it. So if you're talking about the Asian population or, or whatever population you're talking about, but looking at additional factors, whether that's economy, so that the uh, issue was a hospital system that is really proud of the fact that they've increased African-American employees. Great, but if they're all working at low-end service jobs without a career path, are you really um, accelerating an equity agenda? 
So how about if we take a look at that population that you're bringing in and break it by economy and see what the, the earning rate of that population is. Great. Thank you. Another person over here. Uh, hi, I'm Rania from Oakland, California, and um, I work for Urban Strategies Council where we have a long history of relationship with Auckland uh, Unified School District. So we own student level data and we started um, collecting this data um, for so many years and um, for 2015 school year, uh, we started analyzing suspension data and disaggregating and breaking it down by race and ethnicity and starting to uh, find out the disproportionality of suspension and the lens of suspension and reason of suspension among white and African American, Asian, Latinos, and we we were shocked by the rates and uh, the difference in suspension rates, and we started to do to try to reach out to school principals and um, further. Um, communicate our findings with the community and say how the data shows that the rates are crazy in, uh, on the school level and the grade level and the sector level. And um, I think we one of the um, bright spots that we found some schools suspended 0% of the students, uh, students of color, while other spots were shockingly um, uh, suspending like up to 30% of students of color. So we started, we want to take this conversation further to school leaders and try to uh, make schools exchange best practices and what are the policies that they are doing in schools that do not suspend any uh, students and what are the other policies. Thanks. I'm just going to say that's a great example um, of how uh, just using data and not wanting to trigger implicit bias and perpetuate stereotypes. If you just look at disproportionality in school discipline, many people will walk away and say, well, why don't African American students start acting right and not looking at what the under underlying drivers are. Hello, uh, Rachel from New Orleans, the data center. Uh, we just released a 72-page report on uh, racial equity in New Orleans. It's called the Prosperity Index. And one thing that we discussed a lot about beforehand was the order of our legends when it came to race and gender. So I noticed um, the Census Bureau, oddly enough, always has male above female, even though it's female majority. Mm -hmm. And it comes first alphabetically, so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so New Orleans, it's a briefing about New Orleans that is majority black. So we went back and forth between like, should it be African American, white, Hispanic, Asian? And um, we just, our executive tr director just changed from a white female to a black male. And we're, you know, in Louisiana, we're trying to have people, like credibility and stuff. So it was a long conversation about um, are we going to be perceived a certain way? But we just ended up going with what we can quantifiably mm -hmm. justify. Okay. So. Thanks. Other examples? Um, also using the school agenda, um, we were saying in our community, um, we've actually, our school district was actually sued um, by a group of um, African American um, interests. It's a group called CoQuebs. Um, and so they've been dealing with that over um, a great many years. Um, you know, they had some court ordered stuff, but, and, and that has gotten better and worse. But we had a new superintendent came, that came in recently, um, and we're really seeing some very, very different things. Um, and part of, the, part of what we talked about was the, the fact that. Um, the lawsuit previously had made the school district actually retrench, retrench in terms of being willing to share any data mm -hmm. about anything. Um, with the new superintendent coming in and bringing a new research director in, they've been very transparent. And so that transparency, they will sit down with this group and say, look, this is what the data is showing us. Do you think the data is right? Um, you know, and, and working on solutions about, well, you know, uh, what might we do? Um, uh, to change the trajectory of this data. So it, it's really been, I would say, a year and a half or two of trust building. And I think that that was really one of the key issues in being able to trust the data and the use of the data to uh, come to solutions. 
So we talked, uh, we started talking about the kind of insufficient uh, narrative that you can create using publicly available quantitative data. And then that kind of led to, I think the challenges that all of our organizations face with uh, getting really um, connected to communities that we may not um, represent or may not be represented in our staff or, or um, in our work as frequently as they should. Um, and this isn't my organization, but pointing out a really great resource we have in Columbus is the Kerwin Institute on the study of race and ethnicity. And um, they've, we probably don't take advantage of them in Columbus as much as we could, um, but they do work nationally. Um, so pointing out their opportunity mapping project, um, which really does get to a very, very granular level and working with communities to understand opportunities that exist in communities. And then um, an example of um, some work they did that was a little uncomfortable, but really, um, really illustrative of issues was recreating redlining maps in communities and just surfacing very clearly um, that this is an issue, as, as Mike mentioned yesterday, it's an issue that uh, feels like it was decades ago, but the neighborhoods look almost the exact same in a lot of communities. I got you. I have Katie over here. Um, this is the short version of the story, but um, working uh, with a couple of other partners, including the um, Black History um, Society and the NAACP, um, we did a study of the Community Development Block Grant uh, fund distribution and found that um, all of the money was being filtered through white-run organizations. And the city responded that there were no black-run organizations um, in the community that could meet the requirements. And working with that group of partners, we identified and then mapped 124 black-run <laughs> organizations. Um, and that map is being posted on the NAACP, but also is affecting um, the way the foundations and funders and hopefully the city um, are beginning to think about how they can distribute those resources. That is such a beautiful story around attacking a dominant narrative, like the idea that there are not organizations run by African Americans that like that's just makes me feel sick and so to think that you now have a map that demonstrates what those organizations are great work okay what any other people want to share one more, one more. Um, we just uh, I wanted a caution to say that disaggregating by race also could potentially um, allow people to assume that all races are somehow homogenous even within the race, right? Yeah. And so um, we have one uh, graphic that we just started to put out in Baltimore that even though we have a 20 year life gap between the highest and lowest life expectancy neighborhoods, we took two neighborhoods that were both African American, about the same amount, 93% African American, there's a 10 year life expectancy gap between those two neighborhoods. Uh -huh. And we took two white neighborhoods that are both 63% white, which is in a majority African American neighborhood, unusual, and they also have a 10 year gap between life expectancy. So there's spatial disparity even yeah. within kind of racial disparity and having enabling people to get to the why this racial disparity exists in the data that we show. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good point. And th thinking about opportunity mapping um, th that this gentleman um, talked about, it's a great way to look at those disparities in physical place. So like, it's not like the, when we're talking about health disparities, um, again, if you've got a headline that's about health disparities, where people often go to is individual behavior. So, you know, if you're working on health indicators, like people aren't eating the right food, they're not getting exercise, it's all about individual people's failure, as opposed to you look at a map, find out where there's food deserts, find out where there's a lack of infrastructure with parks and open space. Those are the things that actually drive the condition. So, and um, just to say like the, it's not an argument around like individual responsibility. Yes, you know, big thumbs up, individual responsibility. But if we're not looking at what's creating the reasons why there's disproportionate outcomes, it's insufficient. So it's both and. Okay, I, I thought you had someone else there. Good, so we have one more exercise that we want to do with you. Um, and that involves one of your colleagues, um, Rebecca from Charlotte, who is going to um, be, she's gonna be kind of vulnerable in front of you. 
Um, and so we need to give her love for that. But, but just I want to tell one more um, story before um, before we bring Rebecca up here. A couple of people have mentioned Kids Count Sites or Annie Casey as a funder who does a lot of work around data and um, race. Uh, we worked with, the, in Texas, the Center for Public Policy Priorities on their Kids Count report. Um, and just love the, this is the executive summary introduction to the report. The headline, we all want a bright future for our children and we want Texas to be a place that makes that bright future, possi bright future possible. That's the affirm statement, right? And then it goes on to talk about the um, Texas is 41st in child well-being. It's not good enough for Texas. And then it looks at the, we can, we can often trace racial and ethnic gaps in children's health, education, and financial security to historical policies that created barriers for families and current policies that perpetuate them. Close the gaps by intentionally breaking down any obstacles to certain groups of children reaching their full potential. Then the whole report is actually framed around looking at what those disparities are and what the institutional drivers are. So if you want to talk about housing, let's talk about the history of redlining. Let's talk about the housing mortgage um, targeting of low-income communities of color during the housing foreclosure crisis. Look at the conditions that actually led to the disproportionality we, we have right now. Their whole report is structured around that really well done would encourage you to check it out uh, so now we are going to turn it over to Rebecca and she's going to share some of Charlotte's data and we're going to have some conversation around it can we give her a round of applause So at the beginning of this session, Leah described me as brave, which I, of course, appreciate. And Julie mentioned I'm going to be vulnerable. The truth is I'm super excited to be here today because there's some work I'd like to do with my partners in the room on our um, Neighborhood Indicators Project, the Quality of Life Explorer. And what better way to kickstart that work than to get a whole room full of really smart, awesome people to give me some ideas. So um, uh, I, I feel really lucky about that. I uh, wanted to share just a little bit about the work that we're doing in Charlotte as context for this activity. So um, our, our Quality of Life Explorer, the partnership with the City of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County and UNC Charlotte's Urban Institute, who is extraordinarily well represented here. Um, and and uh, the format that it's in now, has it's been that general format for about five years, um, although we've had the project since 1993. Uh, when I came on, um, so I started at the city about five years ago as we were revamping our uh, our neighborhood indicators project, and um, you know I wanted to get really down into it and and uh, talk about every indicator and disaggregate by race and have have a whole narrative. I remember I did I did a write up on one of our uh, variables about um, access to banks and credit unions, and I included some framing around um, uh, kind of predatory lending. And I got my hand slapped. And this was in our community engagement division. And uh, Charlotte's kind of a pro-business kind of place. And um, my, my boss was concerned that that might come across as not so pro-business. So you can imagine if um, I tried to get down into conversations about racial equity, uh, where those conversations would have gone. But that was five years ago. And Charlotte, like most of our cities, is a very different place today. So uh, in, the mean, in the interim, we had um, the Chetty Study Equality of Opportunity Project that ranked Charlotte 50th out of 50 for economic mobility. The sensitivity of those rankings aside, I would say it was a good thing for our community to say maybe we're not this bright, shining place for everyone that we claim to be. Um, of course, kicked off 18 months of task force activity, and uh, while the while the city was a part of you know um, supporting that task force, we also got a little bit impatient, and the task force had a hard time really tackling race explicitly. 
So we got a group to, together within the city of Charlotte to say, why are we waiting on community recommendations? We are an institution with policies and practices and procedures that have an impact on uh, racial equity, and we can go ahead and start looking at ourselves first. Um, we, don't, we don't need to tell somebody else what to do, and we don't need to wait for somebody else to tell us what to do. So we kicked off some work internally at the city looking at economic opportunity and racial equity. Then starting last June, we engaged with Gare, and Julie and her team uh, came down and worked with us um, both on normalizing the conversations about race, um, which uh, it, was, it was actually a lot of fun. So the city of Charlotte, we, we pave roads, we build bridges, we dig ditches. We don't do any of that people stuff that the county does. So we're mostly, I mean, to be frank, bean counters and engineers. And if you have ever been in a room full of bean counters and engineers, that's not a really, really comfortable place to start talking about race, especially when the majority of them are white. Almost half of them are traveling into the city of Charlotte from outside of the county to work every day. And uh, but we've, we've made a lot of progress together, and we've had, we have eight pilot projects going on, taking a look at our um, programs and services and how, uh, how we can change our policies to impact racial equity. Um, the City of Charlotte is also part of the National League of Cities cohort around racial healing and transformation. Um, we also had in 2016 a um, officer-involved shooting where one of our police officers fatally shot a black man, Keith Lamont Smith, uh, Scott, excuse me, um, that led to what we call in the polite South um, s several days of civil unrest. Um, which is a very, a very polite way of saying it. But one of the impacts of that event in our city um, was that it really helped to move our elected leadership um, to be more uh, willing to tackle race, and the whole community was able to have a more explicit conversation. So all of these things kind of working together have brought us to a really different place. And what I, what I would love to be able to do, not just... Um, kind of with our data internally, but the neighborhood indicators work as data that's put out externally. And so we'd, we'd love to take a look at how we use those data uh, to advance um, racial equity. And we have a, we have a um, kind of blank canvas from which to start. And so I think um, Leah's going to give you some instructions about uh, what we're asking you to do. I'm going to thank you in advance because it's my hope that this will really kickstart uh, some important changes to how we um, collect and share our data, but how it's and also how it's used to advance racial equity in Charlotte. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you um, for volunteering the Quality of Life Explorer to participate. Um, so at your tables, you have a series of handouts. Um, the first is a packet of maps. Um, I didn't want to trust the internet, so I printed them out for you. Sorry about the environment on that one. Um, but there, the first map you can take a look at is um, a map of some of the racial distribution in Charlotte. And I apologize for excluding many racial groups on this map in advance. Um, but for the sake of the environment, I did not do that. So what the activity we really want you to do as a table is to pick one of the indicators um, or two if you're feeling really ambitious um, and to work through some of these questions that are on the other handout. And please consider taking notes that we might collect and pass back to the Charlotte team so that they can see your ideas. Um, we're really wanting to think through how could data be better used to drive change in Charlotte. So the Quality of Life Explorer does have a lot of maps on it, but they do have a lot of narrative elements to the website as well. But also consider what should they be linking to? Are there resources they should make sure they hit? Are there ways you discuss the indicator? Should the indicator be included or not included if you think it's an issue? But try to have some of those different conversations. And then the other handout, um, just to point out um, another resource for you, is the, um, the Annie Casey Foundation funded a brief for the Kids Count group about 10 years ago, and I've summarized their checklist for you. Um, but I encourage you to go look through the whole brief. 
um, on ways to think about how you might use data differently, uh, thinking from indicator selection to how you're presenting the information. So we're going to give you 15 minutes, I think. Yeah, about 15 minutes to talk through, and then we'll come back for some group discussion. <laughs> 
bring this back. If you guys could take one last minute to write down your thoughts, we'll come back for some discussion. All right, um, we have microphones. All right, we just wanted to do, uh, see if we could get a few highlights. Um, if, if anybody wanted to share an example they worked through from your table, um, questions or challenges that came up, was this easy to do, hard to do? Noah? Right, yep, no. There was double pointing there, sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, so we looked at the housing code violations um, example. Um, one of the things we thought that would be really helpful up front was if there was like a statement of purpose that was added to the map because a lot of times, I mean, we looked at the map and there's no, actually no mention of race on the page at all, but having looked at all of the other maps in right. the sequence, um, it was obviously quite evident and we weren't sure what exactly the information was kind of trying to convey. Was it that all of the areas that have more higher minority populations are actually more blight violations and then worse places to live, all of that. So a statement of purpose could help clarify that. Um, we talked a lot about um, basically like trying to unpack more of like the nuance around c the code violation process in particular because it's so complicated and can be so charged at so many different points. So you know, going between like, um, or separating out petitions, complaints versus field observations could help identify what might be driving those complaints in a more um, effective way. And then um, in terms of other mechanisms for communicating um, on the website, we thought that we questioned whether a map was necessarily the best way to represent this as well, because if you're just mapping out where the code violations are, again, is that sort of trying to point towards these more minority areas and how does that work? Um, and then in terms of types of community resources or advocacy groups that we would want to see links for, um, just generally kind of like a more targeted communications framing strategy for the code enforcement, in particular something like maybe a neighbor guide, like how to engage with a neighbor who might have an issue without mm -hmm. necessarily going straight to code enforcement right away. So can that might help reduce some of the racial charges there as well. Um, did was there another table that covered a different indicator? <laughs> Since you volunteered him, Kathy. That's called voluntold. 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 Voluntold, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we were looking at the low birth weight map, and we thought it would be interesting to compare it to access to prenatal health care, or what is likely the non-access to affordable prenatal health care. Uh, and then potentially uh, clean air, clean water, just environmental factors that could uh, impact health and low birth weight. Um, well, uh, first of all, it works really great on my phone, so that's exciting. Um, <laughs> and I personally was excited that you have really good community engagement indicators, including the one around municipal board members by neighborhood. 
and very curious how to get that data and how can we get that data. Um, but then uh, you don't have a diversity indicator. So you have disaggregated by race, but not necessarily how diverse the neighborhood is itself. So for example, if it's 50% black and 50% white, that's actually an interesting you know, finding. And so if you did create a diversity indicator, whatever you wanted to use, the dissimilarity index or diversity index or whatever the ways there are to calculate diversity, and then have that be a theme across all indicators. You could have you know, every single one of your indicators by diversity, like low diversity neighborhoods, low birth weight, high diversity neighborhoods, low birth. Is there a pattern? Is there a pattern with housing um, violations? Is there a pattern with all of the indicators across a, a theme, which would potentially be around diversity? Thanks. Others? We, um, we chose to do the violent crime one. And I think a lot of our discussion focused around um, adding a lot more language around crime as a function of both enforcement and of rep reporting. And so this particular map um, and, and dialogue presents the data as is, but doesn't maybe take into account some of, um, some of the different way that, the way that our service of people and communities can actually impact that. So some things we had said, if that data were available to add, would be things like um, phone wait times, or police response times, potentially a comparison to nonviolent crimes. So uh, maybe like a percentage of all crime that is violent. So maybe these neighborhoods are not particularly unique in the percentage or, um, of violent crimes. There was a lot of discussion also around um, where the perpetrators of those crimes are actually coming from. Are they within those neighborhoods or is that just where that crime happened? And so how much of that is kind of internal crime versus external crime? And we actually felt that the, I mean, a lot of it is really great. We felt especially the, the related variables and additional resources were wonderful. We suggested something maybe around dates of next public precinct meetings or something that would get people actually having that dialogue or creating a new um, responsibility. And that was all before our conversation then devolved into how like police is not the same, policing is not the same as crime reduction and how there's like way bigger issues, <laughs> systemic and otherwise, and maybe we should deal with poverty. And so then that's as far as we got. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you five more minutes. We would have gotten there. Um, I, I was just going to go next because we also did at, at this table um, the violent crime page. Um, and I think, you know, we really uh, we hit on some things that other people have mentioned. Um, but one of it was there's a the small statistic around this one sentence around feeling safe. And we talked about feeling safe and violent crime are not the same thing. So. Um, you know, sometimes feeling safe has to do with traffic accidents. Um, uh, violent crime includes domestic uh, abuse. That is a different effect on the neighborhood than um, other kinds of crime. We talked again about perpetrators and victims and the crime location is not the same as where the victim and the perpetrator are from. And I think all of this sort of led to the idea that there in some sense should be a section on what this data doesn't tell you. Um, to, to going to the point that we've ha had thematically over the day about data being used um, as a negative reflection on the neighborhood. So what does this data not, not tell you and things to consider when you're using the data, um, which led to a conversation around who is the audience for the data and how they're gonna use it. So is it for the people in city of Charlotte to make policy changes or to deploy their resources, right? That's a big issue with the policing. Um, is it for teachers, for community groups, et cetera? So those were some of the things um, that we highlighted. Thank you. Um, I think we are about out of time because I know we have camp sessions. Um, we are hoping to have some further discussion around racial equity in one of the sessions, but I do want to give it back to Julie to just close us out with any final comments. 
I'll make this quick and just say thank you so much for being an engaging, receptive audience. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, as I said in one of the slides early on, love data and especially love data when it's used to advance racial equity. So thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of your conference. Hello, it's camp time. Okay, so I'm gonna read out the sessions that we have. Um, they're also posted on the wall and in the YAP, but just because I'm gonna read them out anyway. Oh. Okay. Um, we also had a lot of camp engagement this time. So we have an overflow section on the boards, which is like breakfast, airplane, dinner, conversations. But, you know, we're going to...